We are gathered on the occupied territory of the Kalapuya people, who today are represented by the Confederated Tribes of the Grand Ronde and the Confederated Tribes of the Siletz Indians. We honor with gratitude the land itself and the people who have stewarded it throughout the generations and who will continue to do so for generations to come. Furthermore, Willamette University's history is fundamentally tied to the first colonial developments in the Willamette Valley through the Oregon Mission Indian Manual Labor Training School, which was eventually relocated to the area this campus occupies today. This acknowledgement is the education and inclusion we must practice in recognizing our institutional history, responsibilities, and commitments. In reflecting on our history, we honor the past, present, and future indigenous students of Willamette. And we are grateful for the opportunity to study, work, and be in community on Kalapuya land. My name is Joe Bowersox. This, I'm the Dempsey Endowed Chair in Environmental Science here at Willamette University, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to the 17th Annual Dempsey Environmental Lecture. Uh, it is also my great honor to uh, uh, recognize the ongoing and continual support of the Dempsey family, uh, which is represented tonight by Heather Dempsey, Massimo Malinacci, and Jan Dempsey as well. And we want to thank you for the support. <laughs> Finally, it is also my honor to introduce one of Willamette's best and brightest, who will then introduce tonight's speaker. Adriana Latonia Nicolay is a DNA scholar from Chiprock, New Mexico on the Navajo Nation. A Gates Millennium recipient, Adriana is an environmental science major and an American Ethnic Studies minor and president of Willamette University's Native and Indigenous Student Union. Spending the last few years here at Willamette working to hold space past, present, and future for Indigenous students. Adriana works to acknowledge Willamette University's foundational history within settler colonization of the Willamette Valley and the Kalapuya people, specifically through the disregarded native narratives of the students who attended the Indian Manual Labor Training School. Adriana also helps organize the annual powwow, which is happening 10 days from now on March 16th, mark your calendars, and advocates for more events like this lecture you are here to attend tonight. Adriana's commitment to creating a better campus and world is a constant reminder to us of all to work and all of the work that we must do and the hope we must have for brighter futures. Adriana. Thank you for that. <laughs> Um, tonight I have the tremendous honor of introducing our speaker, um, Amy Cordalis. Amy is a member of the Yurok Tribe of Northern California, which she serves as general counsel. She is a fisherman, attorney, author, and mother. Her family is from the village of Requa on the mouth of the Klamath River in Northern California. Several generations of Amy's family have fought for the legal rights of the Yurok people, including her great uncle, whose Supreme Court case, Mats v. Arnett, confirmed the boundaries of the Yurok Reservation and the tribe's fishing rights. Amy continues her family's legacy by working toward restoring the Klamath River while advocating for indigenous human, cultural, and religious rights and tribal sovereignty. Her work has been recently highlighted in High Country News and in the New York Times. Amy graduated with a BA in political science from the University of Oregon and attended law school at the University of Denver and the University of California at Berkeley. Prior to joining her tribe, Amy worked in private practice and with the Native American Rights Fund, the nation's premier nonprofit law firm representing in, in indigenous tribes and tribal organizations. Please join me in welcoming Amy. I agree 
Ki Neknao Amy Cordalis, Nuwak Rekwa, Numitewa Waklao. Good evening. It is um, just a pleasure to be here um, and an honor to be here uh, in front of you all today. I really had a fantastic day on campus, and I want to thank um, all of the students and the professors and the administration. Uh, for hosting me here today, and a particular um, grateful thank you to the Dempsey family for sponsoring events like this. Uh, it's so important that we create venues to share diverse stories and also share um, visions for hope and future and sustainability, and I hope that's what we can do tonight. Um, I want to, before I get into the, the, the beginning of my talk, I want to acknowledge that like many Oregonians, I have a very diverse family and history. Uh, my mom's family has a deep connection with Oregon, and in fact, my um, grandfather graduated from Willamette in, was it 64? And, I'm <laughs> and then my uncle, who is here with us this evening, graduated in 75. Uh, so welcome home. <laughs> I also have a cousin-in-law here too, so welcome. Um, so, but tonight I'm going to focus my remarks on my father's side of the family and talk about my experiences um, with the Klamath River. Um, but before I get to that, one other point is, you know, I think the land recognition that uh, Professor Bowersox did and the university has supported is so important to acknowledging that all of us as Oregonians have a diverse history and that the way to move forward is to acknowledge that there have been historical uh, wrongs. But that's okay as long as we move forward acknowledging that we're all still here and that we have a bright future together as long as we embrace notions and theories of tolerance. Um, and that kind of reminds me of, of a theme that I've been thinking about a lot lately, especially with this current presidential administration, which is that the founders of our country really believed in the pursuit of a better nation, right? The pursuit of a better nation. It wasn't that we were the best, it was that we were always going to pursue to be a better nation. Um, and I think when we acknowledge our historical wrongs and we move forward to more sustainable practices, living in balance with each other and the natural environment, that's how we get to that more uh, better nation. So with that, um, what I'm going to do today is talk about the Klamath River. So across the national landscape, the Klamath is known as one of the most complex water resource conflicts in the country reeking of tensions between farmers and the communities that stand for and depend on fish. Unfortunately, no one in the basin is thriving. Fisheries in the river are at historic lows. Farmers are struggling with constant uncertainty. The source of the problem in the Klamath is that the Klamath Basin water is over allocated. Until water is managed sustainably, meaning that we all respect the ecological needs of the basin as equally important to our own needs, we will all suffer. To truly reclaim the Klamath, we must remake our water laws and policies to support the values and principles of the communities of the Klamath Basin and Westerners as a whole. So tonight, during our time together, I will share these ideas in more detail sharing the history of the basin and my personal experience with culture, law, and values. So my story begins at the start with the Yurok creation story. In the very beginning, the Yurok, well, excuse me, the creator wanted to make a place for all Yuroks that would be good. Creator started with the land and made the land, then made the water and the rivers and the oceans and made the 10 immortal souls the animals, and then made the people last. And the creator told the people that all of creation was to live in balance with each other. Each creature had its own role and place to make creation work. Creator told the people that they would never want for anything so long as they lived in a balance with each other. They, may, they must never take more than they needed. 
And as long as they lived this way, they would always have enough. So the Yurok people lived according to this agreement, to live in balance with the natural world and to never take more than what they needed. And this is our cultural covenant, our agreement with the Creator. I don't want to over-romanticize Aboriginal times, but for the Yurok people, it was pretty good. Our Aboriginal territory included almost 500,000 acres of territory along the Pacific coast from Damnation Creek to the north to the south of Little River Drainage Basin and unbroken along the Klamath River to Bluff Creek Drainage Basin. This includes the lower 45 miles of the Klamath River in Northern California. Here, the weather is mild. There is plenty of food. This allowed for a complex society to develop that had complex art, culture, fashion, social structures, economy, law, and religion. And it was all guided by this cultural covenant, by this principle of balance. We celebrated this understanding in annual world, world renewal ceremonies. The tribe was governed by heads of families from the major villages. A system of law was developed to govern behavior and reinforce cultural values. Specific crimes had, had fines or payment, as we call it. Fishing holes were owned by families. Owners had property rights that were similar to the way that we own property today. Trespass was a crime, uh, payable to the owner. Uh, permission to fish in someone else's hole was required and fishing holes were inherited, sold, or traded. Fishing, of course, for salmon was the pillar of the community. Salmon was eaten fresh, cooked on redwood sticks over an open fire, dried, canned, or traded. There were salmon in the fish, or excuse me, there were salmon and other fish in the river year round. And my family lived at the mouth of the Klamath River in the village of Requa. Requa is at the north side of the mouth of the river. Requa historically was a large village. Uh, we were a dance family, which meant we have obligations to put on dances each year in order to uh, pray and dance for a sick child or for the world renewal ceremonies. Our livelihood was depended and determined on the river, or by the river. The river dictated life. The first white people that my family ever met were Russian sailors. So this story, I just love it. Um, my auntie, my great auntie actually tells it to me and, and I'm gonna try to remember exactly how she says it, but the way she tells it is that the, the Russian sailors came into the Klamath estuary and um, the Yuroks wouldn't let them off the boat. Apparently, the Russians were really hairy. They had long hair coming out of their eyebrows and all over their faces and all over their hands. And there were bugs climbing in and out of their eyebrows, out, <laughs> out of their you know, chin hairs. And so you can imagine what this must have seemed like to the Yurok people. You know, Yuroks are, are shorter and, and we're brown and you know, not hairy. Um, and so I kind, of re I kind of envision this as like a, a, a like meeting of like the Pirates of the Caribbean and the Ewoks and the Star Wars, you know, coming together. <laughs> but the gist of it is that the Yuroks would not let the Russian sailors off the boats. Um, eventually, the Yurok women agreed to do the Russians' laundry, and so they spent days scrubbing the clothes, um, and sometimes scrubbing them down to rags just to get them clean. We also traded with the Russian sailors, um, and there's evidence of that on our old regalia. There are Russian trade beads, um, but they always left, and they never stayed, and the Klamath remained wild and under Yurok control. It wasn't until the mid-1800s that settlers moving through the east to the west came to Yurok country. In 1851, Yurok's negotiated a treaty with the United States government. 
It was never ratified by Congress due to California's opposition. Behind closed doors, it was agreed that the treaties would never be ratified, and instead, they would be locked deep in the US archives, not to be released until decades later. In 1855, the Yurok Reservation was created by an executive order. Reserving one mile on either side of the river from the mouth of the Klamath up through 45 miles um, to the Yurok village of Wichpec. Notably absent from the reservation were the ocean villages and the Yurok's high country to the east, which are our spiritual lands. In the creation of the Yurok Reservation, the Yurok people reserved Aboriginal practices on the reservation, creating federally reserved fishing, hunting, and water rights, and maintaining the tribe's jurisdiction over the reservation. The purpose of the Yurok Reservation was to create a permanent homeland to preserve the Yurok tribe's fishing way of life. In the creation of the reservation, the federal government made a promise to the Yurok people that they could continue their fishing way of life. So keep this in mind. But things didn't stay so rosy for that long. Around the 1920s, the state of California considered the Yurok reservation no longer Indian country claiming that the General Allotment Act of 1887 had disestablished the reservation. The state asserted jurisdiction over the land and people, including Indian fishing on the Klamath River, which basically meant they prohibited Indians from fishing at all. In classic Yurok style, <laughs> Yuroks kept fishing and selling salmon, continuing their fishing way of life. They became salmon bootleggers loading wagons with salmon, covering the top with redwood tree branches to cover up their catch, and eventually selling fish to the mob in San Francisco. That's a true story. <laughs> By the 1960s, my great-grandmother, Geneva Matz, was sick of bootlegging. She was a proud Yurok whose family had always fished and, eat salmon, or, and ate salmon from the Klamath River they had survived by the river. The river had determined her livelihood and it was time to come out of hiding. She had had several children, all of whom fished for the family and most of whom at some point or other had been cited by the state fish and game warden for fishing illegally without state license on the Klamath River. She and my great uncles and aunts knew they had what they called Indian rights, which privileged them with the right to gillnet on the Klamath River within the Yurok Reservation, free from state intervention. One cold night in the late 60s on Brooks Riffle, which is absolutely actually named after my great, great, great grandfather, um, my great uncle, Raymond Matz, was arrested for fishing for the last time by the state of California. That night, he and his brothers had heard the game warden coming up the river in his motorboat. At the time, the state was one of the only boats on the river with a, a motor, and so you always knew when the state was coming up. Normally, when they heard the motorboat coming, they would pull the fishing net uh, to the side of the river bank and hide under a tarp and wait for the, the state to pass. But tonight, it was different. Ray decided to not pull his net. The warden stopped, gave him a ticket, took his net, and left. Appearing in court a few weeks later, Raymond refused the judge's offer to dismiss the charges and return the net in exchange for a $1 fine, declaring he had Indian rights and was going to pursue them. With the help of a California Indian Legal Services attorney, which in part had been Indian country's response to the civil rights movement to empower Indian people, pursue his rights he did, and all the way to the Supreme Court. In Mass versus Arnett, the Supreme Court held the Yurok Reservation was not disestablished by the General Allotment Act, and it was still Indian country. The ruling affirmed that the Yurok tribe retained its federally reserved fishing and water rights and jurisdiction over the lower 45 miles of the Klamath River. 
my family would forever fish the river. The Supreme Court had said it would be, or so we thought. The Matt's decision was issued in 1973. Shortly after, the state of California notified the federal government it would regulate Indian fishing on the Yurok Reservation if the federal government failed to do so. In response, the federal government decided to regulate Yurok fishing by putting a moratorium on it, completely closing the fishery to Yurok people. The 1978-79 moratorium started the fish wars of the Klamath River. To enforce the moratorium, the federal government sent federal marshals equipped with full riot gear to enforce the moratorium. Warlike conditions followed. The marshals used intimidation tactics, anything short of shooting people but not sparing dogs or other animals, breaking limbs of elders, punching faces, carrying automatic weapons, batons, and wearing bulletproof vests. The Urox responded in equal force. They kept fishing. They bought machine guns and carried them on their persons at all times. In my family, several members came home to Requa to protect each other, recognizing they needed to organize and that there was strength in numbers. They planned fish-ins. In classic Yurok humor, my great-grandmother and grandmother planned a fish-in in which they took a cork line, which is the top of a gill net, took off the fishing line or the net below it and attached their old bloomers to the cork line and then they went fishing. <laughs> as was the practice, like we can all laugh at this. <laughs> um, as was the practice, when the Fed saw any Indians out fishing, they would go to them and they would pull the net in. So the federal team dressed in full riot gear went out started pulling the cork line, and sure enough, they saw some rather interesting uh, fishing nets, as you could say. <laughs> In late 1979, the fishing wars ended when the federal government lifted the moratorium by adopting a set of regulations to regulate the Indian fishing. But I am confident that the old lady Yurok bloomers had something to do with opening the fishery. <laughs> At the end of that summer, uh, my father married my mother, who was months away from being pregnant with me. He sold his machine gun that he used during the fish wars to his cousin in the church parking lot just before the wedding ceremony. Thanks, Mom. She's really embarrassed right now. <laughs> I was born before the next fishing season. A couple days later, or excuse me, a couple decades later, a uh, tragedy hit. In September of 2002, an estimated 70,000 to 100,000 100, fish died on the lower 15 miles of the Klamath River, entirely within the Yurok Reservation. This was the largest fish kill in American history and it all happened within the Yurok Reservation. In our traditional ecological knowledge, there is no equivalent. There is no story of a fish kill, which to us tells us that this was entirely man-made and unnatural. As we learned more, we understood that the fish died because of a fish disease called ick. Ick spreads from fish to fish when there isn't sufficient water flows and water temperatures raise and salmon come in. That year, the amount of fish returning was high and people were excited to, to catch so much fish. When the fish started dying, the people stopped fishing immediately and everyone went into crisis mode, wondering what had happened and what we could do. But there was nothing we could do at that point to stop the fish from dying. By the end of about a week's week passage, um, the fish were lining the banks of the river dead with their bellies rotten three to four layers deep. I was a junior at the University of Oregon at the time, home for the summer for uh, an internship with the Yurok Tribes Fisheries Department as a fish technician. I had spent the summer going to fish camps to, to count fish I had gotten to know all the people in the fish camps. I had held their babies. I knew their stories. 
And everyone was shocked at the kill. It was like a family member had died. And I thought of my great grandmother, Geneva, and all the things she had done, the sacrifices she had made. And I thought she was rolling over in her grave because of this fish kill. I decided to attend law school to devote my career to preventing a fish kill and trying to fix the river. Just like me, for many people, the 2002 fish kill was the miner's canary alerting us that there were severe management problems in the basin that had potential to cause catastrophic ecological permanent damage, including making the salmon go extinct. The river had had enough. So how did this happen and how did we get to that point? So to understand that, we need to move to the top of the basin in Oregon. So stepping back again to the 1800s, across the country, settlers were taking control of American rivers through dams for irrigation to support agriculture. Water was treated as a tool for economic development to encourage settlement of the Native American West. The nation viewed waters and rivers as a commodity needed to be extracted from a river to canal to be put to use. Water left in stream, wild was a waste. To support this, certain laws like the prior appropriation doctrine were developed. In fact, in the seminal 1855 Supreme Court case decision, Irwin v. Phillips, the first court upheld the prior appropriation doctrine and affirmed a miner's right to divert any and all of a stream away from its natu natural channel to support his mining claim. The rule of first in time, first in right reigned, meaning whoever diverted the water from a, ch a, a river had the first right in times of priorities. Beneficial uses were defined as consumptive uses for agriculture, mining, industry, and domestic purposes. In-stream flows or water for ecology is not recognized as a beneficial use. By 1890, California had the most irrigated lands in the nation and boasted the largest number of adults earning a living from agriculture. Across the West, between 1890 and 1900, in only 10 years, irrigated lands grew from 3.5 million acres to 7 million acres. Local farmers petitioned state governments to help support agricultural development, and the states turned to the feds for support, which comes. And a quote from the Secretary of Interior of the time I find very insightful, and I quote, I have no fear that America will grow too big. A hundred years hence, these United States will be an empire and such that the world has never seen before and such as will exist nowhere else on the globe. Irrigation is the magic wand which is to bring about these great changes. And changes did it bring. In 1902, Congress passed the Reclamation Act. The Federal Bureau of Reclamation was created and authorized to develop irrigation facilities to harness waters and rivers for streams for human uses as the Secretary of Interior found practical. And it didn't take long for the Bureau of Reclamation to move its way into southern Oregon. In 1905, the Klamath Irrigation Project was authorized as one of the first federal irrigation projects. The federal Klamath Irrigation Project presently covers territory in Klamath County in Oregon and Siskiyou and Modoc counties in Northern California. The history of the project is worth sharing. This area was originally Klamath and Modoc Indian country in Aboriginal times. Settlers accompanied by the first U.S. Cavalry in 1876, excuse me, 67, led to the Modoc War in which Captain Jack led the Modocs to Thule Lake where they protected themselves against 1,000 troops for over six months. Captain Jack was never defeated by the cavalry. Instead, he was betrayed by his own people who turned him in. He was executed in 1873. Five years later, farmers introduced irrigation to the Klamath area. To support the farmers, federal investigation into the Klamath project began in 1903. 
The project was authorized in 05 and construction began in 1906. The project was originally estimated to include about 2,500,000 acres of rangelands that would be transformed into farmlands and 80,000 acres of reclaimed lands. Between 1906 and 1950s, the BOR, Bureau of Reclamation, built over 1,400 miles of canals, laterals, and diversions to move water from the Klamath Lake, the Klamath River, Clear Lake, and the Lost River, and Thule Lake to irrigation fields. Since its inception, the project has served between 1,500 and 200, um, or 2,500 farmers, and the project now includes over 340 acres. So this is an important point here. At the top of the basin, the United States made another promise to the farming community that they would have enough water to support their agricultural life. Now moving to the mid part of the river, uh, four dams were built between 1903 and 1962. The dams were built without fish ladders, blocking access to approximately half of the basin's traditional salmon habitat. So this is the history of the basin. And this is where the tension in the Klamath Basin had started. So at the top of the river in Oregon, you have one of the largest clam, or excuse me, the largest reclamation projects in history, developed to divert water from the Klamath Basin system to ag lands to support agriculture. In the middle of the river, the federal government supported dams that blocked access to salmon. And then at the bottom of the river, there was Yurok country. And of course, the promise the federal government made to the Yuroks was that we would always have our fishing way of life, which of course requires water. And that tension is that the three of those interests don't merge, right? We can't, there's just not enough. The basin's over allocated. So the current status of the Klamath Basin the 2001 ag shutoff and the 2002 fish kill were really the apex of the conflict in the basin. And for the last 20 years, we've been working towards solutions. I can say that we have built better relationships with all the people in the Klamath Basin, um, the, the tribes and the farmers, the environmentalists, the states, the power companies, we're all talking. We understand each other's story and we have mutual respect for one another. I wish that I could report we've made some progress in terms of restoring the river, but we haven't. Uh, the river is still very sick. Fisheries are collapsing. In 2014 and 2015, 80 to 90% of the baby salmon on the Klamath River died because of a fish disease called sea shasta which is caused by basically bad water flows uh, and not having enough water to flush out the fish disease, which is, comes in the form of a little polychaete that sticks to rocks. And when you have just a basic low flow in the river, those polychaetes rejuvenate and grow and then attack the fish. So all those fish died. The result of that was that when the runs, those same runs returned two to three years later, which of course was 2016, 2017, 2018, the runs are decimated. For the last three years, the Yurok tribe has declared a fisheries disaster. We've closed our commercial fishery uh, for the last three years, and in 2016, we closed our subsistence fishery for the first time in history. There simply were not enough returning salmon for us to have a sustainable harvest. And of course, that goes back to that cultural covenant where we agreed we would never take more um, than what we needed. And in this year, in 2016, excuse me, we felt like it was better. We just didn't take any at all. But there is hope. Uh, we are working on the largest dam removal project in history. Uh, four dams are scheduled to be removed from the Klamath River and construction on decommissioning will begin in 2021. We're moving through the regulatory processes now. But more work is needed to bring peace. And understanding this, my experience on the river forces me to believe that we must reclaim the Klamath. 
We must reclaim the Klamath from the ideas, principles, and values, and policies that led to its demise. Reclaiming the Klamath will be the work of rebuilding it with management goals that are guided by principles of conservation, fairness and equity, and ecology. In doing so, we will also reclaim our balance and relationship with the land and learn how to live sustainably as humans on this planet. Our existing environmental laws are not enough. While environmental laws such as the Endangered Species Act, the National Environmental Policy Act, the Clean Water Act are helpful, they aren't enough to accomplish the goal of sustainable resource management when they are up against the values that settled the West. They are like layers on a rotten core. We must replace the core with the values related to sustainability. Critically, the core of water law, the, the law that supports this modern environment in the West, is outdated. We need to reimagine what good governance is to achieve sustainability and not simply add more weight to the existing regulatory tree. While certainly in the West, our views of acceptable water use and relationship with the water and land have changed, our laws governing water use have not. And indeed, water law reflects some of the most out of touch with modern conservation ideals and notions that exist in the law today. Water law was, to cre was created to support the practices and the philosophies that have caused so much hardship to our communities and that has created many of the current environmental problems. The notion that conservation is irrelevant to natural resource management. We should all be outraged that this is the status of our law because the sacred, limited nature of water calls for us to be our best and to use water for our highest purpose. The future of the Klamath Basin can be sustainable and we can blaze a trail if we look to manage Klamath Basin resources with three things in mind conservation, fairness, and equality, and, ecological, or, and ecology. Moving to conservation, we should consider how water can best be conserved in the basin. Ideas I have are to reduce demand of consumptive uses. One of the, the uh, policy directions that's being considered now in the basin is the idea of reducing the project size to reduce the amount of water needed for um, irrigation. I think there's a lot of value to this approach. Since 2002, the Bureau of Reclamation has spent over 70 million in the upper basin for farmers for drought, drought relief alone. And what has that accomplished? Farmers really aren't any better. Uh, that money and future monies could be spent uh, buying back project land from willing sellers, retiring the water rights, and then perhaps what we could do is put solar panels on some of that land and then that could be a source of power for the project. Uh, these are some of the ideas that are actually being considered right now. In addition to that, with respect to conservation, we should look at irrigation practices and incorporate more efficient water uses. We were talking about some of that this evening. Um, and certainly in the basin, one of the conversations we're having with the farmers is how might they, ir how might they update their own irrigation practices to incorporate um, newer ideas like crop rotation or even planting uh, crops that use less water. And certainly increasing organic agriculture in the basin would be helpful. Equity and fairness. So the entire basin should be treated equitably and fairly. Now this is kind of mind-blowing for the Klamath Basin because we have a, a deep history of winners and losers. Um, and we go back and forward between either the farmers or the, the fish, and it goes back and forth. Um, and I think a lot of this is created in part by the rules that are in place, but also in the federal government's management of the project. There's a lack of flexibility and ability of the parties who are so, infect or so impacted by water decisions to actually participate in water management decisions. So to that end, if we were able to increase 
uh, more principles of equity and fairness, including things like defining the basin in large terms, right? Comprehensive. Uh, right now, the, the lake and the river are divided. And of course, there's a state line that goes through all of that, right? Um, Oregon has its own set of state laws. California has its own set of state laws. And you would never know that the river and the water that is subject to those laws are hydrologically connected. And it results in really bad management, right? Um, so one of the things that we need to do is, is move towards a comprehensive management of the basin that acknowledges what happens in the lake affects what happens in the river. Um, we need to include an inclusive stakeholder forum in which to make water management decisions. And I think this could be accomplished fairly easily. Every year, the Bureau of Reclamation develops a Klamath operations plan that sets the pots of water for lake, for ag, and for the river. Uh, the stakeholders could be a part of that process. The feds could listen to us in that process and help decide how we want to use water for that particular year. And in that time, we could consider what is the most fair share uh, or fair way to share water. Um, Perhaps ag had a really great year, but the river didn't have a great year. And then maybe the next year, we give the river a little bit more, those kinds of notions. I think importantly, too, we have to acknowledge ecological values of leaving water in the river and turn away from a, a consistent theme that still reigns in the Klamath, which is valuing water for agriculture over other uses. And finally, with respect to ecology, we need to return the flows in the Klamath River to a natural hydrograph. Right now, the, the flows on the river are set to benefit ag, and then whatever happens on the river sort of happens. Oftentimes, that results in a hydrograph that is completely unnatural. Um, for months at a time in the winter, the flows will be like this, which of course, in a, a natural hydrograph, there would be ups and downs. Um, but a lot of times that doesn't happen because of the way that the water is controlled and prevented from coming down the river. Certainly there are in-stream flows for the, for the coho salmon, which are listed under the Endangered Species Act, but those flows are only the bare minimum of what's required. There are fish in the river in the Klamath year round, and there is no in-stream flow for those fish. There's just none. So what we need to do is go back and look at the natural hydrograph of the river and make sure our water management is more consistent with that. So from my perspective and the work that I've been doing in the Klamath Basin, I think these three things have great, great potential to help solve the very human problems in the Klamath Basin. It's a pathway forward towards sustainable fisheries and agriculture. Yurok people believe we have a great privilege to be the first people of the lower Klamath River, to have fished the same salmon runs at the same places since the beginning of time, generation after generation. By now, we share the same DNA with these salmon. We have evolved together, which I think explains why sometimes the fish scales stick to me after fishing. <laughs> But with this privilege comes responsibility to take care of the resource, to be a good steward. I call on all of you, I call on the people of the Klamath Basin who love and care about the West, about salmon and farmers, to join me and the Yurok tribe in our sacred responsibility to be good stewards of the Klamath Basin. We all play a role, a new water ethic, a new sustainable Klamath Basin can be achieved in the Klamath through negotiated agreements, identification of archaic federal and state water laws and policy that no longer serve us, and subsequent amendment of these laws and policies consistent with the ideas that I discussed tonight. Indeed, by reclaiming the Klamath, we can set an example for the nation of future sustainable resource management. Wakalau, thank you. So.